the status quo of how we go about getting change. There's people who have long decades of history of various struggles, attempts to collaborate, fallings out, um, this person's too political, this person's too much of the establishment, all of those kinds of things that prevent us from moving forward. And one of the really amazing, magnificent things about Mayor Duffy's gift to us with this issue is the, ta the people around the table that have come together, the new people I've met who are so brilliant, so articulate, so passionate, that are at this table. And if we can stay at this table, and if all of you, all of the people in the community, can come to that table at some level, and if we can expand it and reach out, we can make some really progressive change. Um, so that's the status quo that we cannot return to, is our petty problems that keep us from reaching what we need to for our community. Okay, I'd like to say, you know, we're assuming that it's the mayor control, mayoral control is going to be defeated. I'd like to say once it's defeated, because hopefully these voices that we're hearing today is the voices that's going to be ultimately heard. Okay, because it's the voices that count. We have parents up here, we have community up here, we have students up here who's speaking to that. And ultimately, that's the voices that should actually count. So once that does take place, Basically, Howard pretty much said everything <laughs> that I wanted to say, and that's why I was kind of nodding in agreement. Um, one thing I'd just like to um, say that once that does happen, hopefully that, that sparks a, a whole um, domino effect of maybe having this um, conversations and discussions that implemented change, because clearly there needs to be one. And the fact that the mayor presented one that I don't agree is absolutely the solution, but the fact that there needs to be a change so we don't go back to that status quo needs to be recognized and hopefully encouraged to be implemented. Um, the changes, I'm like Howard, if I had a week, we'd probably sit down here and talk about it. But I guess to, to, to cover something that Howard did talk about, what I noticed is the makeup of the schools. Um, when you walk in there, I mean, it's like, got to be at least 85%. I didn't check the, um, the site, but the demographics there, we're talking about 85% children of color. That's not the same when we're talking about the staff, okay? And we're going to be realistic. I guess I could be the one that's real about it. That becomes a barrier and a challenge. When you have someone that is not from your culture, that does not share the same nationality or um, struggles or challenges that you may have shared, that may be a challenge, okay? And I'm not finding that we're addressing the fact that some of the people that work with our children aren't addressing that challenge, are not meeting that challenge, and it's not, does not have a desire to meet that challenge. Now, I'm not going to say that people who are white cannot work with people of color, but I am going to say this. It takes a lot of work because I've been on the other side where I was the minority, okay, and I worked with a lot of children that were, did not look like me, that did not come from me, and I can honestly say we were not on the same page, and it took a lot of work and effort for me so that I can reach them, we can um, talk, we can dialogue, and they can learn from me. That does take effort, and I'm not going to be the first, I'm going to be the first to say that it really does. As far as that, um, the, the 85, 85 type rule, there's also one thing that I noticed, is that there's a lot of research being done about what actually works for children. I think the Rochester City School District, and I hate to say this, is anti anything that works for children. Anti. If you come up with something that says this does not work for children, best believe it's going to be policy next week. Okay? We, we, there was this thing that came out in the news that was no surprise to me because I have teens that basically cannot get up before 12 o'clock on their own. Okay? Before 12 noon. But they were saying that their brains do not function that early in the morning. Okay? And for a moment, for a hot second, it was a hot topic and we started school at a later time in the morning. Okay, and this was documented, this is research that has been shown. The following year or so, we have a tier system that brings the kids into school even earlier. Okay, and that's just an example of a lot of things that's anti-children. Anything that you're finding, like these bipolar things that's going on, we're not addressing the needs of the kids, we're disciplining them. So I'd like to see we not go to the throwaway policy, and that's what I've termed it. I put it in quotes. We have a throwaway policy. We throw away the kids, we throw away the parents, and we throw away any hope of these kids being successful. And I'd like to see that change. Thank you. It's something when you go last, a lot of people said what you were already going to say. It's something, how I know the study you realize over at a part of another study about 
the bipolar, is that in some instances they're even um, making it four years old when they're saying that bipolar, and that's truly so sad. But what we have to do, as I said, more dialogue. The same energy that we put out to fight this spiritual control thing is great. But what we gotta do, we gotta keep this going. The flow has to keep going to make our schools better, to, to work more with our teachers, our principals, work more with our school board, and to work more with everybody else. In closing, what I would like to um, just read one more thing in closing. February 6, 2009, Boston Public High School level outpaced state gains in the percentage of students earning a high school diploma. A report released yesterday by the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education indicates 59% of the members of the class of 2008 graduated from Boston public schools four years after ending ninth grade from 57.9% among 2007. And that's one of the schools that Mayor Duffy talked about, Boston, New York. So this is what we have. This is the bottle that he wants to go by. Thank you so much. Help me thank this panel. <laughs> and now it's your turn to participate. You've heard their perspectives. You've heard them weigh in on what they think and feel about this issue. And so um, I'm going to slip this mic here in the middle and invite you to um, line up if you have a question, a comment for the panel, and I would ask that you um, say who it is you would like to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you. he will be accountable, then the buck will stop with him. I have a question. Where's the plan? Where's the plan to show that you can be accountable? You know, I, I mean, there, again, I don't know what the mayor is talking about because I haven't seen any plan. I don't even know what that means when he makes that statement, that he can be accountable, that he will be accountable. So I don't know, Hubert, really how to give you an intelligent uh, answer to that question. I have no idea what he's talking about. If I could um, agree with Howard, you're definitely right in saying the mayor hasn't been accountable. I mean, there's so many examples already. Um, we had to furnish this table. We, we had to bring you guys here. And it's wonderful, the people who, who are here from city council, but look how many people aren't. I mean, he's already not accountable. <laughs> Hello, uh, Shaogi Tell, Nazareth College. First of all, I want to thank all the organizers for putting together this important event. I think it's uh, a key way to continue to raise the consciousness and organization in the community. Uh, the main, I, think, I guess the main point I want to make is, if I'm not mistaken, the mayor recently announced that he's going to put off uh, trying to seize the school district till June 2011. Um, I do like to think that part of that is, is, is a result of our efforts. Uh, but, but I also want to caution everybody not to let your guard down for a single second. And that the battle for control of city school district is by no means over. I think the mayor and his cheerleaders are making a calculation that we are going to wane, wither, fall asleep, lose interest, lose momentum. And I think we need to actually do the opposite and step it up and keep the resistance to this, um, to this uh, effort to seize control of the city schools and violate basic constitutional rights, we need to keep this effort alive. So a year is kind of a long way away. It's easy for some movements to lose steam, to wither, and all this sort of thing. So we need to be very vigilant and organized. And the last comment I want to make is this notion about failure and the failure of the schools. Yeah, of course the schools are failing, but folks, the entire society is failing. The entire economy is failing. The entire political system is failing. You're not going to have schools flourish when the entire society is failing. Mayors everywhere are failing. Governors everywhere are failing. Even presidents are failing. But very few people say, okay, well, let's uh, throw them in the trash bin of history. 
So let's keep our eye on the ball in terms of keeping the resistance going because I think the calculation is they want us to go away and, and I don't think we should go away. People who are doing important research in the community, I forgot to mention Dr. Shaggy Tell, who was just at the um, microphone. He's another person who's doing valuable research uh, in this community. And I think they also are waiting for these elections to be over before they continue the next episode of their attempted coup. Okay. Uh, oh, excuse me. I just wanted to ad address that gentleman's statement. It wasn't about seizing in um, 2011. What basically the legislation says is that he could take control into 2011 if he was given that. It wasn't about giving up into 2011. That, that's the soonest it could take place was 2011. Uh, good evening. First of all, congratulations to the uh, uh, committee panel to bring this matter even closer to the public's attention. I want to share something with you. Some of you mentioned before systems are the issue. That's true. In this building right here, this is a $40 million building. I opened this building. A $40 million building, first principle here. Let me tell you something. I can read blueprints. I was reading the blueprints when we were just putting this building together. There was a padded room on the drawing board for this school. A padded room. So I asked the architect, what's up with this padded room? He said this. We were told to put this room in here so when kids get out of hand, you can put them in there so they won't hurt themselves or somebody else. I said, how many other schools have a padded room? They said, no. I said, we're not putting one in here either. <laughs> I then made them convert that padded room to the office on the third floor that became the office for the IB program. International Baccalaureate Program here at Madison. That's what you're fighting. Something else about systems. You wonder why the kids are going around in circles. The city gives Rochester $119 million. The operating budget is $700 million. Where does the other $600 million come from? Grants, governmental entities, etc. They come with the floor and the ceiling. First of all, you got to be on the floor to get the money. And if staff gets the students up, you lose the money. Even if no child left behind. If no one's left behind, you don't get any money. Right. And the moment nobody is left behind, you lose all your money. That's what's happening to our kids. It's not that our kids can't learn. It's not that our kids cannot learn. What we have better use our time doing, getting with our lawmakers, our congressmen, our senators, we want you to send can-do money to the school system. If you get them up, we're going to keep them up. That's the kind of money you need. And until you change that formula, you're going to always be starting over. You can't win a race if you're always going back to the starting gate. student government advisor, so I'm going to put my question to the students. Um, I hear from kids all the time about the punitiveness of schools. Kids talk about having to wear uniforms, kids talking about restrictions during the lunch period, kids talk about how they're treated in the halls and how they're spoken to, having to go through security systems as if they go through airports when they're coming into school, how they're yelled at constantly. So Megan, you mentioned that student government is one of those illusions. Please tell me how I can get your help and your parents' help in fighting these oppressive restrictions on your humanity. I think that student government has the potential to be a really important part of school. I think that having elected representatives from the student body is a good plan, but it's it's not being used to the group's advantage. It's it's um, it's a sham, I, I think. And, and of course, you'll find lots of dedicated people on student government who'd like it not to be. Um, but I think that at least at, at my school, the the administrators do not listen to the student government. They're 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 in show. 
is how I feel, and they don't need to be. I think we're afraid of letting them not be there and show. I think we're afraid of letting them help other people learn. Um, like the, the man before you said um, about our children's ability to learn. Children have a remarkable ability to learn. And instead of looking at this as Mayor, at Mayor Duffy as taking power, centralizing power, why don't we look at the students who are succeeding and the students who are learning and the students who have a passion for it and see how that's happening and let that go over to our other students. I, I think that looking at the mayor is not the answer and I think that looking at people on student government, looking at people who really do care about what the PTA is doing, looking at students who tutor other students. Like, we've already, we already have those resources, and when people look at the school as some kind of black hole where children are lazy and children can't learn, we, we have a huge problem in the district, yes, but we also have, as we, as we have with every single generation, we have the children who are on student government, the children who learn amazingly, and, and we can learn from them. And adults should be able to swallow their pride and do so, and not be afraid to give student government the power to make decisions. Because right now, it's just, it's just a show. My name is uh, Ricardo Adams. I'm a painter. I ain't even gonna talk about our mayor government. My position. Ain't nobody in the country right now got a uh, solution to this education problem where they're gonna get a Nobel Peace Prize. For real. But somebody will be here giving that to them. But my uh, thing to you is my challenge to everybody up here, man, is we ain't talking about the uh, elephant in the room. Uh, we say they're gonna eliminate parent involvement. We need to increase parent involvement. I go to a lot of meetings in the school boards and our parents are missing. And that's not just our parents' fault, that's the kids' fault because I got three kids and I don't think they're any more special than anybody else's kids. My kids are manipulative, manipulative and they can get they can get things done. They can like if they want to make me go to a school board or whatever, kids are amazing. I mean some of them they are there and the kids today are the same way. Some of them are so rude and blunt they just make their parents go. Other use the kind game. My daughters tell me, uh, when I tell them no, they say they just want to be happy. Then the guilt trip makes me give them what they want. <laughs> Whatever the students got to do, you gotta get you gotta say, man, I gotta get my parents involved, man. Um the the politicians, the school boards, when they see some new faces, some new parents, numbers, that's what they respect. They don't respect care nothing about me because they see me all the time. I'm challenging you up there, students, man, get your parents to the meeting. Maybe not not just you, your friends. I've been to the meetings, man. Uh, the demographics there don't match the system, man. Uh, we ain't showing up. Our parents ain't showing up. And we need to make them show up, man. And I'm challenging the students, man. If you don't manipulate your parents on anything else, man, make them come to the meeting. Make them get involved. <laughs> Can I, can I quickly just address um, the, the gentleman that um, just made the comment? Um, quickly, I just want to add this. Yeah, uh, basically, what we're, we're dealing with, and this is coming from a parent standpoint, there's a lot of, when you see when a system is failing you and a system keeps you out on that margin, you know, there's a lot of hopelessness that sets in. And me, I take the stance that, you know what, and we all say that charity and everything else begins at the home and, and the discipline and all that, but I also expect that, that there's a reality. A lot of our parents aren't parents, okay? A lot of our parents aren't there, and they're not doing what they should for whatever those reasons may be. And, um, and this is coming from someone who's on both sides. I am a parent, and I've been on, in, the, in the classrooms. And what I can honestly say that we... And, and, and it goes back to that, that, that African proverb, it takes a village to raise children. And I am charged with it, and I take that responsibility, rather than keep singing the same old song, the parents should, the parents should, the parents need. And I understand that the parents are supposed to do a lot, but I also accept the fact that there's a lot of parents that are not. And I take that responsibility on as a part of this community and the person responsible for educating that child. Because regardless, irregardless of what the parent is doing or not doing, 
each child, no matter what they come to the table with, deserves an education. And you know what? The Education Act says they have the right to one. Uh, could, I, could I add just a brief comment? Uh, I would not reject Ricardo's uh, idea that uh, if our students can help us, they ought to help us. We need all the help we can get. But certainly we don't want to lay that full responsibility on them. So I challenge us the Community Education Task Force to keep doing the work that we've been doing and to in fact intensify that work and so that we need more of us in the streets now. Only a few of us have been out in the streets, but a few of us have been consistently in the streets, especially Mary and the people who have come out with Mary. So we've got to intensify our efforts to organize parents. Now what Mona raises is very critical too, it's a very important issue. And there are examples of systems of support for children. See, part of the discussion that goes on in the city school district all the time is part of the blame game. You will hear educators say, if parents don't get involved, what do you expect us to do? And usually, in many cases, the answer is nothing. Wrong answer. Because if we can't do anything, I always say, and some of my colleagues get mad when I say this, we ought to give back our paychecks and go home and admit defeat. So there is something we can do collectively, and there can be systems put in place. I've been talking for Dr. Ray knows for 20 years. I've been talking about a little thin book called The Hair Plan, written by Nathan and Julia Hare, in which they lay out a comprehensive system of support, especially for the children whose homes are, I don't like the word, but are dysfunctional and so forth, where parents are not involved. And so we can't take the attitude that we can't do anything. We must do something. And the more children's parents aren't involved for a whole variety of reasons, the more we need to struggle to make sure that support is underneath those children. They need it the most. Good evening. My name is Glenn I am a retired city school district teacher. I've lived in this community for 30 some odd years. I came from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And I'm very embarrassed uh, to the Rochester community from Rome. Involvement. What I'm saying is that I am an advocate of getting parents to get get their rights back. And another issue that I'll talk to later. Um, you know, just excuse me because I had a stroke recently. And now, uh, I'm embarrassed because I go to the school, particularly with our male use issue. They are wearing their pants on their butt. Mm -hmm. There's no school code. You got right there in the front security guard having black males coming here with their pants down and not learning nothing. And you wonder why they go to jail. Okay? And it, it's appalling to me that black people are miseducating their own children and they don't want they want they don't want to blame themselves how are you going to go to the larger community to get our children to a job and they going out dressing <coughs> 50 dollars pants wearing on their behind and they can't read the application. Now, I, I, I am totally married. Now, other than that, I want our kids to be successful, and I want them to graduate. I also want to be academically smart when they can't do other than rap music. But my other issue has to do with this current superintendent. I have some issues with him. Matter of fact, I wish they'd take him out of the school. That's my wish because when you got a, a black man addressing himself as a farmer and not identifying with our children because he's a Haitian, 
what what's it all about? And I would blame Malik and Glenn, I mean Miss White, bringing this band in our super tenor and don't identify with the kids that he's supposed to be, giving us the quality education that our kids need. And my thing is, if you don't have a super tenor identifying with your kid, where 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 your position that you're standing on? I mean, what the board are doing? And as uh, far as the mayor control, that's another issue. Politically, black people don't understand politics. Matter of fact, I don't think they care. You have a few out there trying to do whatever they can. But our kids running up the street, then you see in the uh, Sunday's paper, all the girls downtown fighting the can on, and they put that in the paper. Where were the churches? Where are the, the community involvement leaders? Where are they going? What are we going to do with our kids? We're going to sit there and we're going to, like you said, sit down here and talk about it and have no solution? That's my point. I thank you. Charlie, can I say something? I, I don't I haven't said anything. Um, publicly against Superintendent Brazard, and I'm not necessarily saying anything publicly against him now, but I remember when the board chose him, uh, many of us in the community thought that we had chosen one of the brightest uh, superintendents that we had ever had. And I still think he's bright. He's intelligent, he knows education and so forth. But I, I must say now, and if there is any relief, uh, Superintendent Brazard and I have any relationship with this uh, if this uh, changes our relationship, so be it. What has become clear now is that Superintendent Brazard is supportive of the privatization agenda. And that's a problem. I don't know about his uh, identifying with our children or not, but I do know from studying and from paying attention, and we should have had a clue uh, after understanding that he came out of the Broad Institute. The superintendent appears for all practical intents and purposes to support the privatization agenda. And that's a problem. My name is Charlie Richardson and I'm a member of AQE, which is Alliance Quality Education. Been to Albany a good many times to get extra money for the district. They have wasted. Uh, the problem is with the schools right today, and it's a ground floor, it needs to be done is the youth. I would say other than Megan, the other three, your teachers don't know what you want to do in a future. You don't have guidance counselors that are guidance counselors. You have guidance counselors that are disciplinarians. And you have principals and vice principals, and many of them is disciplinarians. Where if they want to correct this, okay, want to correct this, ask the students. What is it that they need in their schools? 60% of them are in the wrong schools. Okay? Kid who wants to be a veterinarian. His brother's been trying for two years to get him out of Franklin, out of finance, in the bio. Couldn't do it. But, because of parent involvement, we went to uh, the person that's supposed to be a parent advocate, and it happened in two days. That's what we need to do. Listen to us. Find out what it is. You can, you can solve so many problems. You really can. And you get the first hand knowledge. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to bring you to the table to find out what you want, and then you will bring the parents to make sure you get it. But one thing I want to say is this Title I money. A lot of people don't even know. Does everybody know what it is? You know it's being wasted? Okay? It's a slush fund for principals in all of our schools. It's a slush fund. Maybe not all, there's some good, good schools. But the thing is that money is supposed to be out here in front to help us that know what about education to get the parents engaged and bring them in. That's what the money was set up for. It's not being done. And don't expect to have a lot of people listen to you, okay? I've addressed the school board many times, uh, city council many times, 
uh, counting many times. And I don't even ever got one response. And that was a letter from a uh, past uh, president of the Rochester uh, City uh, warning me that if I ever took more than three minutes speaking again, uh, I would be eliminated. Well, that's one thing that I have. I have a voice. But that's the only people we've heard of. But I'm out there with five, 6,000 people for the last five years asking students what is it they need and encourage them to come uh, to the Board of Education, which we, we've had some luck with. They listen to the kids. But please, let's start there and let's have that money available for Title I to build. And the other thing is, we, everybody's got to get together and say, uh, these parent liaisons can no longer be under the finger of the principal. Thank you. You, um, you asked a few times, what does it do the students need? And I learned a lot from the struggle um, about a year ago for, for making sure the budget cuts don't hurt kids the way the city would see them hurt us. Um, and uh, what I saw was that the first people to be eliminated were art teachers and guidance counselors. And gym teachers were seen as marginal. Uh, teachers were seen as marginal, especially the guidance counselors. And you, each time you asked, what do students need? I just kind of wanted to be like, we need guidance counselors. We need, we need um, less pressure. There's, there's all this pressure to impress colleges to take AP chemistry when you have no desire to be a scientist, to stress yourself out with nine classes that give out homework when you're only interested in two of them. And it's, and it's the counselors we have now who tell us we need to do that, who tell us that we need to impress these colleges. And I don't think that they're into what we really desire, what we're passionate about, and what we're eager to learn and we're hungry to learn. Our guidance counselors are academic disciplinarians, um, and we need some compassionate people who really care about what we're hungry to learn about. I'm so glad you invited us to. Uh, my name is Ed Vesnesky. I'm a resident of Rochester. I'm a former teacher. And I have followed this quite thoroughly. And I've been disappointed on it with a lot of things that have happened. But I feel strongly that narrow control is certainly not the answer, to say the least. I say that philosophically. I say that from the evidence that it's not working. I don't know how many times people have to say that before the other people who defend it really, really listen. Now one of the reasons is because the debates that were supposed to be held have not, to the best of my knowledge, been held. And I'm waiting still for the mayor to have what I would consider to be a debate, but be it with Dr. Callum or other people. I've attended a lot of these functions. I've I'm free, I feel comfortable making a statement. I've seen where the, I'll say it publicly, where the business uh, uh, journal, Rochester Business Journal, stacked the panel. I've been in where your questions had to be, and I can understand some of the need for this, where your questions are written down and then not answered. So I have not seen what I would consider to be true debate. On the macro level, it doesn't work. The only places that you see it, first of all, there's only a handful, strong mayors. If Mayor Daly wanted to have the Sears Tower turned upside down, it would happen tomorrow. And in New York, sure, he can get, I'll run another term. I'll buy my way into that one. And so these are the kinds of people that you have doing it for control, for this and that. You've got the people who can't wait to get their teeth into it with the money, so you privatize education and this and that. That's scary. That is scary. <coughs> However, as you've said and others have said, there are problems. So the one thing, whether it was somebody peddling snake oil, or whether or not it was a mayor, or whether or not it was a... Who's the one with the band? 
selling something. Whatever it was, it woke up the community to a degree. And I hope you continue this. And I hope you and your art colleagues and your other students will find ways to vitalize, revival, or that's not the word I want, to make it happen in the school, suggest open meetings, after school, you name it. Inviting students to this, for example, to invite it'd been nice to been filled with students, to do all the things that need to happen so that people start to truly address the issue. The one common denominator that is typical of the, of the schools that are failing, although we all know that we're, what, 20th out of 29th or something like that, or whatever the numbers are, we're on the low end of the totem pole in this country, so education is failing all over the place. We're being driven by No Child Left Behind, model after a school in Texas that was a fraud, a fraud that everybody knows it, and still we're stuck with it. How many deceitful, inappropriate things are we going to have to tolerate and listen to before we take charge of this thing, before we keep what we have? On the micro level, On the micro level, look at the situation. Now, I did ask the mayor on paper whether or not he intends to finish up his <coughs> term and whether he's going to run again because he's asking for five years to do something. And I said, are you going to do that with the idea in mind that maybe Albany is calling or whatever, okay? And I didn't get an answer. I didn't get an answer. When you have some, when you have a situation where somebody may or may not be around, when you're going to have new mayors, when you're going to have this, the only reason that the cards haven't collapsed more so in these towns is because the mayor has been there in New York for eight years, and, and Chicago, he owns it, etc., 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 because as soon as they drop the ball, how the hell are you going to put Humpty Dumpty back together again after you have torn it apart and turned it upside down? I would, uh, being a mayor and a city council member is a full, full job. I say that with most respect. And I want my mayor to do what the mayor is supposed to do. Revitalize the city, bring jobs into town, do this, do that. Don't tell me totally about crime going down because it's going down all over the country. Do what the job was supposed to do, is supposed to do, and let other people do their job. And get industry involved because when I asked the questions of industry, I ran an internship program. When I asked the business people, I don't want to hear about some token thing that two or three of them were doing some song and dance so it makes everybody happy. So I'm going to take a quick break in this and just to remind you that um, after we have um, our last speaker, um, we have food for you. So we will um, we'll have food for you to eat and nourishment for your bodies. This food will make it quicker. Um, I want to... Okay. Um, I would like to make a comment about the gentleman that just said something. We have a problem, and some people just want to complain about it but don't fix it. And people are disappointed, but they don't try to do anything to fix that either. And um, being a student at Wilson Foundation Academy, I've seen kids that are... are um, walking down the halls thinking they're all that and worry about what everybody else says. And um, students are just complaining and complaining. Some people do stuff about it, but they try to not say nothing because they're afraid of what people might think. And honestly, I don't really like how people treat other people because of how they can't express what they mean 
and they can't express how they feel about certain things. And it's not fair to not have your words spoken and be able to express yourself. And this is the reason why, this is one of the reasons why we come to school to learn, to sometimes make friends, but to get, mostly get our education and to speak out of things that we know we can't talk about at home. So, there you go. I think that um, what you're saying about students um, is, is really important, and I think that if our, if our administrators weren't um, disciplinarians and, and if we saw a really respectful resolution of conflict, which I, I do not see at high school, it's, it's appalling. When there's a problem with a student, the, the resolution of it is not, is not admirable. It's, um, it's something you wish to be over as quickly as possible. And I think if our administrators set an example, our students would totally take that on. I, I think if it was if it was made it admirable to be respectful and solve conflicts the way I know children would, if they had an example, I know children would solve the conflicts that way, we would be able to move forward. But our administrators, for goodness sake, they make fun of us. Um, that's how they get attention. I, I was at an assembly. Um, a little address before prom telling us that we weren't allowed to drink before, during, or after prom. And um, a friend of mine got up because he wasn't going to prom and the, the administrator when running the assembly said to him, what's wrong with your feet, boy? And I think the reason he did that was to gain some respect from the students, was to show the students that he could burn just like they could. And I think that's pretty disgusting to need to gain people's attention by burning somebody. And I'm seeing a pattern of administrators doing exactly what they try and tell us not to do. They don't solve things respectfully. They don't listen. They don't hear the other sides and they don't remain calm. And if they did, if they were admirable in that respect, students would take it in. They'd be hungry for it. They would resolve things in a very inspirational way. Uh, just, just real briefly, uh, Ed had mentioned Chicago uh, and Mayor Daley. Mayor Daley was given uh, more power and authority in terms of mayoral control than just about any mayor in this country. I remember um, uh, Bill Johnson, the former mayor of Rochester, uh, when he was on WXXI being interviewed back in February, talking about uh, when he was mayor, he had considered uh, the possibility of trying to move toward mayoral control. And he said Mayor Daley was one of the people he called. And he said after talking to Mayor Daley and understanding the trials and tribulations of what they were going through in Chicago, he came to the conclusion, Mayor Johnson did, that it would be logistically impossible to take a $700 million organization and fold it into the city as a department. And so um, what he has said, these are his words, he believes that the mayor is biting off more than he can chew. Uh, I'd like to, um, to, to start by well, start, starting back and looking at the, um, the strategy or the, basically the, the attacks on public education encapsulate what's going on everywhere in this country, uh, and, and which are coming from the very top. We have to understand. It says, Mary laid out the, the, the privatization, the corporate model for how schools should be reformed. This is a model which Arne Duncan, the Secretary of Education, and Barack Obama, the President, are now engaged in trying to push in every district they can in the United States. And so we're going to see more charter schools, more privatization, or a push in that direction at the very least. That, that's uh, coming from the top. And you have to wonder why, because I mean, they're using the need for austerity, the crisis in spending, as a way of forcing through the changes that they have to. But basically, it's an attack on the, it's, the attack on the public education does two things. They want to make education as cheap as possible for the ruling class of this country. 
They want to shove it onto the shoulders of the people who work, most, which is where it mostly is anyway. But there's two ways of doing that. First of all, you have to stop people expecting that they have a right to a public education. And they're doing that. They're doing that consistently by running down the, public, the system of public, public education and prioritizing the market as the possibility. It's not just that schools will be privatized and private entrepreneurs will make profits off of the education system. It's also that public schools are supposed to compete with these private schools. And it, there's been this pseudo market constructed in education whereby this is how, this is what will drive schools towards excellence, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't do anything of the sort. It results very quickly in a two tiered education system. Those kids who might have a future and they'll get some resources, and everybody else who will be consigned to uh, the future rump of the public education system. And the, in order to do, and, and in this scheme of things, mayoral control is kind of a blip on, on the whole surface, because in some places it's going to help the people in power to do it, in other places it's going to be an obstacle. And, and it may play out all sorts of ways even here in Rochester. But imposing this program in Rochester and everywhere else means that they have to do two things from the top. They have to separate two groups of workers. The first group are the people who work in the schools, the teachers, the staff, counselors, and so on. And they are the ones in the direct line of fire for attack. Their unions, their contracts, their agreements, their past practice, their schools will be closed down, open as charters, without a union, without representation. And so they are trying to hold the line and, and very much under attack. The other group of workers is more long term, but the rundown of public education is really meant to affect them the most. That is, ordinary working people who should learn that they have nothing to ask from this system, basically. That you are in it for what you can buy or whatever. Public education, one of the great fundamental reforms that have been won by working people, is now in the shopping block, and we have to understand that that is exactly what's at stake. So my question really is, but, and, and so, so you've got these two groups of workers, workers in the schools and the workers in the neighborhoods whose children go to the schools. The working people who basically are the parents and, and the families of the students. Playing these two groups of workers off each other, getting them to blame one another, is central to the possibility of being able to smoothly push down the corporate model of public education. I would argue the, the task of, of, of real education reformers and activists like us is to make sure that those two groups of workers are not po opposed to each other. That in fact, they see solidarity in standing up for each other. Right now, we have the workers in schools and the unions. The workers in the neighborhoods are, by and large, pretty much unorganized. I think what we really need, we've, we've talked about the, the, uh, the start that we've made in, in holding this debate, what we really need is to make sure it happens on a much bigger scale. I'm not sure how we can do that. But I think without that, we're not placed to be able to take the onslaught of the corporate model that's going to keep coming down on us where, whenever they decide that mayoral control in Rochester isn't really going to fit the bill. I, that, I have, and I'm not trying to dominate, but I have to respond to that. While I respect and agree with uh, Brian's critique uh, to a large extent, uh, there's something that he left out. <clears throat> the, the onslaught and the attack on public education that he's discussing is happening in terms of urban public education. We need to be very clear about that. It's not happening in terms of suburb, and that's not to say that it won't, but it's not right now. So we need to be uh, clear about that. I, I, I do agree in terms of the need for solidarity between the working, working class who are entrusted with the development of our children and the general working class, the parents and the community that produces those children. And historically, that has been an antagonistic relationship, especially since the time of integration. I believe we're starting to address it because we're forced together. We're forced together now. We have some common interests whether we want to admit it or not. And so it is an, it's a part of this um, development. It's a new advantage. And so we do have to be mindful of it and, and really um, work to bring people together who have not 
historically work closely together. It's an opportunity. And so you see, and I'm gonna, and I'm not saying this because you came in, Dr. Obensky, I did say this comment because I wanted you to hear it. There's some criticism of people like me in the community now. Because people know that when I was a teacher in the Rochester City School District for 23 years, I was one of I was a strong critic of our union sometimes. And I still would be if it's wrong, but also when it's right. I'll stand with it, just as I would stand with any other entity that is right and that I believe has the best interest of our children at heart. And certainly around this issue, there's no doubt in my mind at this point that RTA has the best interest of our children at heart. And so we're sort of, we're, we're sort of natural allies, if you will. So, uh, thank you. My name is Joseph uh, Ferrara, <clears throat> and I'm just going to read a, a small article in a local magazine called New Health Citizen. It says, Public Education, and the title is Restoring American Pedagogy. <clears throat> so, what's wrong with public education? The answer is nothing. American education is doing exactly what it was designed to do. A majority drop out or finish with little or no skills for a successful life. 10 to 20 percent come out of public education certified trainable, certified obedient to fit into job categories, including doctors and lawyers and teachers and engineers, financial management, media, and of course a variety of service jobs. Only a few, maybe 5 percent, who can afford or are approved for the most expensive schools come out with self-confidence, complementary knowledge, and a discipline to work with vision and authority. Knowledge has become a commodity to be bought and sold with money. And the end result is the elimination of competition. Our children are not capable of competing with those from the highest schools. We've eliminated competition so that only the very wealthy and the few who are approved with scholarships, etc., have the skills with personal power for achieving their ambitions. The rest are taught to settle. This is a complete violation of the American principle of equality for all. The caveat of the Declaration of Independence is that all men are created equal according to their access to knowledge. And with this injunction, America invented public education so that all could have equal access to knowledge. The American pedagogy throughout the 19th century included a study in health, law, and economics, and engineering. Because health is primary, because without health, body, mind, and spirit, you are handicapped from the start. Law is second because we are a nation of laws. In fact, we are the first and still the only nation in this world organized around the predicate that all men are created equal, protected by constitutional law, and all should know and practice law. It should not be an exclusive domain of some priesthood. Economics is third because personal economy and sufficiency is essential to freedom and liberty. And the first law of economics is that labor precedes capital. Another American predicate is that every man and woman is entitled to the full fruits of their labor, and the man in debt is a slave. Engineering is the fourth subject because the development and the usefulness of your skills is what makes progress in the world. Can I give a response? Because I get it. I get where you're going. The current, no, no, I have a solution. The current system and curriculum can be fixed, cannot be fixed. Public education must be completely rebuilt with right principle and purpose to nurture sovereign souls, the fullest personal power, and the blessings of citizenship. We do not need to cry to politicians or academics for change. We can just do it. First, we must immediately, individually, and collectively must work to promote love for all the children in the cities and the suburbs as if they were our own. 
Second, we can organize the use of available space more easily, libraries, community centers, and organize our own educational services. We can recruit teachers who truly want to teach, and we should organize and create a curriculum based on American pedagogy. We should set a date where everybody simply organizes and boycotts the schools. Do not go to the school. And we organize around right principle because we are people in the streets who know what to do. And in the corporate world, they write programs to train you how to behave. So you want to be subject to a program, or do you want to leave? Are we living a life of sophisticated slavery, or are we living a life of sovereign citizens? So I would just, I, I just want to agree that throughout throughout our history, education has been oftentimes a tool of oppressive, oppressing groups and that, um, you know, it has reflected the inequalities in society and has been used for the interests of small, you know, groups of, of ruling powerful people to, to keep other people down. But it's also no coincidence that when we were talking about, you know, vote, voting rights not being an abstraction and the, the um, sacrifices that people made for voting rights, that during that same period, it's not a coincidence that the, that's when the freedom schools were also organized, right? And so now we see members of our movement who are from the Freedom School here in Rochester. So you can see that there are people taking the interest of transformative education, the interest of freedom, the interest of moving beyond these oppressive um, historical trends and, and making it real. So you know, I think that's a really good point that, that you brought up and I think we should, we should take that on. Hi everybody, I'm Jennifer Bannister, I'm with uh, Teen Empowerment. <clears throat> um, I, Mary said earlier that this has been, uh, I think it was Mary, uh, this moment for people to really give attention to educational reform. And, um, and so I want to kind of get to strategy. I, like, there's a lot of ideas about what can happen, but then how to make those happen. And so this could be something that could be answered now, or maybe it's just a larger conversation that needs to be happening. Um, and it's made with the assumption that we all have some self-reflecting to do and something to take responsibility for. Um, so the mayor has shared that uh, the reason that he feels so compelled to do this at this moment is that he's been to plenty of committee meetings and lots of um, efforts to make changes and that nothing really has happened. And that, so that this is an opportunity to uh, have somebody have a... Uh, uh, an ability to say what's got to happen and push it down the line. Um, ben White actually then made a point at one of the debates that actually there's been a lot of incremental changes happening and laid some of those out. Um, and uh, and the school board has you know approved Brizard's plan. Um, so there's these kinds of um, things in the context of also major budget cuts throughout the country and the state. Um, the, the competition throughout this, uh, the country for states to win race to the top monies, which is that Arnie Duncan stuff. So that's the context I think we're in, as well as the, the union really trying to um, figure out, like, I mean, I guess what I would say is that our, our teachers unions are under attack across, across the country and uh, in general. And so a lot of times when that happens, um, people, unions or any group can entrench themselves or they could get creative and innovative. So there's, there's different opportunities. So I guess the question is, um, given what Mary said about our petty infighting that we sometimes go through as a community, territorialism, uh, whatever, uh, Mona pointed out that it's really hard to get our CSD to do innovative, effective things. And I know from as a community organization, I hear it all the time from uh, our, our partner programs that our CSD, it's really hard to get them to collaborate well with community programs. Um, so what? What is the strategy to make things happen proactively now? All those changes that parents, students, community wants, knows have to happen, and maybe there's been some roadblocks along the way. What's the alternative strategy? From our perspective, <clears throat> since this, uh, I'm going to call it what it is, coup, was announced in December, uh, 2009 in the, at the height of the Christmas shopping season when people weren't paying attention. We st have started to organize and we have put together, Jennifer, the Community Education Task Force, 
which is composed of 15 grassroots organizations. It's the largest, uh, uh, in terms of breadth, uh, most, most uh, diverse, if you will, uh, coalition that I've seen in this community since. The last time I saw, I've seen, the last time I saw anything that resembled this was uh, back in the 80s when um, uh, Jim McCullough's uh, late daughter, uh, Alicia McCullough, was, was uh, killed by a police officer. That's the last time I saw anything that resembled this. And it's been together since January. We formed it in January. We've met every Wednesday, haven't missed a Wednesday. We've been in the streets, knocking on doors. That's why we know the heartbeat of the community. That's why we're so certain that the vast majority of the people in this community do not support this. We have, um, I already mentioned, alliances uh, with others who take the same position that we do, and we're going to build on those. So in terms of a strategy, the part of your question about a strategy, we believe that this is it. We believe that this is the strategy and that we need to, and hopefully some of you will join us after the night. We meet at 630 North Goodman Street every Wednesday evening at 530 p.m. We want to build a movement is what's going to be necessary in order to produce the kind of widespread fundamental uh, change and progress, uh, sustainable change and progress that our children and our families so richly deserve. We're going to need a movement, and we think we're that pretty, I, I, I won't say far down the road, but we've started to do that. And we're going to continue to do that work, and we hope you and Teen Empowerment and others will join uh, in with us uh, to, do, to, to do that work. We have to really uh, do some door-to-door -door organizing in terms of parents and community. I'm convinced that we'll never see the kind of uh, broad, uh, fundamental...